Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining. Um, my name is Stephanie Cristello. I am a curator and author who had uh, the great privilege of working on this exhibition project, publication, and program called Sustainable Societies for the Future. Um, today, we're going to be joined by a number of artists, curators, uh, thinkers, and scholars that have been involved within the project over the last year. And before we start with introductions for today's discussion, I just wanted to uh, say some brief remarks and thank yous to all of the partners and sponsors that have made this project possible. Um, so first, I would like to thank our partner Nordic Talks for uh, hosting this event alongside the Malmo Art Museum and of course hosted on the Expo Chicago program platform in conjunction with their curatorial exchange program, which um, this project really originated from. Uh, also the Danish Arts Foundation in Chicago, the Consul General of Denmark in New York, and Art 2030. Um, Outside of this program, um, there's also a book um, which was published by Moto Books in Berlin and designed by Olga Prater. And all of the exhibition and uh, book partners include the Nordic Culture Fund, the Nordic Council of Ministries, Danish Arts Foundation, the Mondrian Foundation, Office of Contemporary Art in Norway, Frame Finland, and the Barbara Osher Pro Suecia Foundation in the US. So as we can see, a huge amount of partners that took, um, that made all of this possible. So, so thank you for that. Um, without further ado, I wanted to introduce the panelists that will be joining us today. Um, three artists, uh, two individuals and one collective that were both involved in the Malmo Art Museum exhibition as well as the Chicago edit that is being curated by the Floating Museum on view through Sunday, October 17, and um, one of the curators and authors for the book. Um, so I'll start uh, first by introducing Cheryl Pope, uh, who's an artist based in Chicago. Um, we also have Michael X. Ryan, who is also based in Chicago, and Hesselholt and Melvang, uh, Sophie and Vivica that are joining in from Copenhagen, and Laura Mott in Detroit, um, who is a curator at the Cranbrook Art Museum and also one of the contributors to the publication. Um, so the structure of today's discussion, um, we're going to give time to each of the artists first to present the works that they made, uh, both in Chicago and Malmo, and then uh, hand it over to Laura to talk a little bit more about her contribution for the catalog and a group discussion. Um, for anybody that is joining in via the Expo Chicago program platform, there is a space for questions, um, which I will moderate at the end of the group discussion, should we have any, uh, but of course we don't have much time and want to spend as much uh, as possible um, with the voices of these amazing participants. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Cheryl Pope, who will be presenting first, and then um, we'll go from there. And I'll be back on screen along with the others um, as the presentation progresses. So we'll see you all soon. And um, over to you, Cheryl. Thank you. Um, also, just to make sure that I when, once I go to presentation, I can manage that myself. We'll find out. Um, yeah, can I go to the first image? Awesome, thank you. Um, first, thank you so much uh, for having me on the panel. I'm really excited to hear what everybody else has to think and more about their work. Um, and also, I wanted to note that I was very enthused by the title of, of art as a catalyst for change. I think the word catalyst hasn't been used in um, art as a change maker and a lot of the power and authority that's given to art um, for change. And I like catalyst so much because it, I really connect with catalyst being a prompt, a push, a, a provocation. And we're thinking about um, this topic and this conversation in relationship to the work that I'm showing both in Malmo 
um, and in Chicago. I was thinking about the, um, the two keywords of internal and external and how to have both this inside and outside that there's a frame that is needed. Um, within that frame, that frame controls the way that stories are told. So integrated in all of my work is the, the notion of storytelling and of listening um, and where and how stories are told and, and untold. Um, and within this notion of interior and exterior in the frame, I first thought about uh, Gordon Meta Clark's work. This one specifically being about the home, the frame for us first being our body, navigating the space between our internal world and our external world, um, our home or our shelter being our next foundation. And in this one where he's split the home um, and in this uh, aspect of his work, calling it, calling it an architecture and the anarchy and the architecture and that kind of split as a means to open, to puncture um, and fracture the systems that are around us. So continuing with this, that strategy, I connect that to my work. If we could go to the next slide. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, so within each of the three works that I'm uh, selected to share here, I'm interrogating a frame of authority. Um, and within this, I, I seek to surface the complexity of experience and puncture the vulnerability that these objects are designed to, to contain. So within the three works, I also consider them more as poetic journalism. So thinking about the politics of listening, what are we listening to? How are we holding these stories and the frames that both limit and um, control um, what we can actually sense within a story. So with these championship banners, this was out of a series called I've Been Heard, where I went to public parks for about three weeks in New York, listening to um, people, young people, um, primarily young men playing basketball and what they, how they identified themselves both as an individual and a community member. And then through that listening, I would hear a statement that really resonated and then unpack that a little bit more with them and um, ask for the, their permission to um, use it within these banners um, to continue to without, I don't use their name. It's really about looking at as a full team, um, as a community of young people in New York City. Um, the next slide. So this is just kind of a visual. Um, also I, for me within the experience was really heightened in terms of the internal and exterior of how I'm seen. We ended up um, playing basketball that and I was forgetting that I was like 35, 36 at the time uh, trying to get out on the court. Next slide. And the next. Next. And great. And the next, yeah, we could kind of keep going through these. Okay, could pause here. Um, so this is a book called Silence the Silence. So the next form um, of authority I was looking to interrogate is the book. Um, so that as a, a, this idea of knowledge, of record, of recording, um, of storytelling and, and, and looking at the book itself as an object of distribution, a book being something more readily available, a way that we can print and reprint and have the same object repeated. Um, the first chapter of this book is called uh, Where Is? Where Is comes from protests that I saw around uh, the murder, the questionable murder of Anna Mendieta. And when I was seeing these protest signs of where is, it really called attention to where is Anna Mendieta? Where is, what is that story? What happened to her? Where did she go? Why isn't she here? And with um, so much of the gun violence in Chicago, um, the police brutality affecting young people, you know, you could be a class one day with Joshua Williams and the next day, he's just not in class. And with that roll call of where is Joshua Williams? So what happened to him? What is the story? Where is this getting recorded? Um, we could go to the next page. The next slide. So this book contains a full, the first chapter is the fear of youth who were killed by gun violence in Chicago. And the second is um, protests that were written by young people in Chicago, speaking out and calling attention to this crisis and, and, and this epidemic of violence occurring in Chicago and nationally. 
all of these pages are perforated and designed to be distributed. So the book itself becomes um, signs of protest. So again, um, provoking and, and interrupting um, these forms or these, you know, that are designed for authority um, and shifting who has this power. Okay, next slide. No volume. Thank you. Awesome. You can cut, cut the volume all the way, actually. Um, so this piece is followed uh, the murder of Laquan McDonald by police in Chicago when Rahm Emanuel, our mayor at the time, ordered $8 million of police body cameras as a reaction to um, the atrocity and the loss of a beautiful young man in Chicago who, who was murdered by police. And when this was the, the, the immediate solution um, and the way that we've seen in the, these past years, how dominant the role of the body, police body camera has come to play in these cases as this kind of neutral eyewitness to mediate the experience between the lawful authority and the civilian. Um, I wanted to bring that object and that lens of, of storytelling and recording into a space of debate um, within the within the art world to compare it to how we've come to understand the language of the lens and um, telling us how this might bend the truth. Um, what is that relationship to? I wore this and followed this young man, um, Trey, in an evening around Chicago as he traversed um, from his home in Pilsen um, to Union Square Park to attend a music concert. Interwoven between these scenes are uh, scenes of him immersing himself within the uh, Great Lake, Lake Michigan, um, as a means of uh, to narrate a kind of internal space that he was going through. After Laquan McDonald was shot and killed, there were several young people who were scared all the time being out and about. They felt like they were constantly watched, monitored, and feared for their life by authorities, those that should be protecting them. Um, so I, as a, a white woman following Trey, a young African-American man, um, at a measured distance throughout the evening, was only questioned by one person um, within this performed role of authority. And so it's really all of that is is packed into this piece. Um, and primarily the focus for me was looking at this frame um, and again, how we are dependent on this uh, frame just to try to become um, the, our, our main evidence of a legal ground of a lot of brutality. Um, so yeah, that's those are the three pieces that I'm showing or that I'm gonna talk about. We don't have to watch the rest of this either. It's okay. It's the rest of my time is up. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Sharon. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's such a beautiful way to start off this discussion, which is um, really about working with and within environments. And some of the ways that you've approached this in your work are much more as poetic devices, but also devices that point to how we see and what mechanisms allow us to see. Um, and how the, uh, you know, the lived stories of people are really influenced and affected by, by this and by the media that surrounds us. And so, um, you know, it's a really unique perspective within the context of this panel. And the next artist that we're going to hear from um, is Michael Ryan, I believe. Um, that's the order of the slides that we have today. And Michael approaches this in a very different way um, that is also very much about the environment and responding to landscape and time and um, how all of those elements of natural space uh, become sort of poetic devices uh, for measuring memory and time and sight. So I'll pass it over to Michael, who will uh, speak a bit about his work now, and then we'll continue. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, it's great to be here today. And could I have the first slide? All right. I'm going to talk uh, a bit about uh, three projects that I've done. Two of them were in this uh, exhibition. Um, 
basically talking about what's under my feet. Uh, and it, as you can see here, walking through Wicker Park. Um, but I basically have been heavily influenced by uh, growing up in upstate New York in a, a 1950s suburb um, right next to a farm. And I was heavily influenced by uh, being a small child with a uh, large woods uh, and hill behind my house. And then by the time I was about 12, um, developers came in and knocked all that down and actually made a big hole. And um, that hole basically was there the rest of my time, uh, my teenage years. Uh, now when I go back, it's all built up with, with homes. But playing as a little child and making tree forts um, and then seeing all of that go away with bulldozers and right in the backyard um, has really influenced the way in which I look at the world and the work that I do. So the image you see here, uh, which is not in the exhibition, but it's where I, during my walks, I was very intrigued with um, stains on the street that looked like Japanese landscapes to me. And so this was actually a Coke spill out of a car a uh, couple doors down from where I live in Wicker Park. And so this is a drawing. I basically would get on my hands and knees and trace it, uh, trace the stain on pl uh, plexiglass. Uh, you can go to the next image. Then I would cut them out out of plywood and uh, make these forms, uh, basically wood reliefs, that to me kind of felt like this, this coffin in a sense. Um, and so I would just wanted to start out with, uh, you know, how my body would be reacting beyond the ground. And it would always freak my daughter out because I would have to put chairs around uh, me because I was in the street, so I didn't get hit. I can go to the next image. All right, so uh, this is an image of one of my pieces at the on the uh, left hand side, the sand on the platform. And this was influenced by being at um, a place called Oxbow. It's an artist residency that actually, um, when I was just out of art school, I uh, washed dishes there uh, for the summer. And um, over the years, I've taught there a number of times. And uh, one of the times I was here, or actually when I would be there, I always was intrigued by the water and the pattern it make as it came up to the land. And so every time I was there, I would take about 25 feet of steel wire and I would just trace what I def defined as the water hitting the land. Um, but for many years, I just, did it and didn't record it, didn't do anything with it. And then one year um, I decided that uh, I would now record it because Oxbow had a circus tent up and that meant that I could use that as my studio for a couple of days at least in order to uh, take this uh, form uh, line that I made and make a grid out of sticks, get a series of people to carry it, lift it up under this tent and then define that line. Um, and so we can go to the next. All right, so what I've done is these are templates, uh, wood templates that I basically would retransfer this line on the plywood and then cut it out. Um, but I would use them on the floor in order to um, put sand in between it and then carefully take the templates away. Um, and so in the exhibition, this wasn't in the exhibition, but the, the, the templates were on the wall and, and in the exhibition, they were on a white wall. But I wanted to show this so that you could kind of get a sense of that kind of negative space. Um, and we can go to the next, next one. All right. And so this is uh, in the entrance of the exhibition, uh, which I thought was pretty, pretty cool. Um, and what I, uh, because I couldn't go over there uh, to Sweden, um, I had to talk to the crew 
and have the crew on Zoom and have the crew interpret what I say and, my, and drawings I made to kind of create the piece themselves. And what was interesting is that the sand they were using was a was kind of heavier and 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 had a different consistency than what I was used to. And so I um, we I learned a lot because I now wasn't the one making it. I was sharing that responsibility with someone else. And so it really was how they interpreted a line in time. So, you know, for me, this is a specific line in time, but you know, if someone else was next to me, the line would look different, of course. Um, and so I was really intrigued by the way in which this photograph kind of shows the line being really crusty and, and rough, which was kind of the opposite of how it would be when I did it. And I thought that was a really great thing. Uh, can we go to the next slide? All right. So this is a slide of uh, two of the crew members who they were wonderful. Uh, to work with. So I, you know, I g gave a number of guides, but then said, uh, go to it and interpret it the way you have experienced landforms and water. And so the conversations we had were really quite, quite rich and felt like I learned a lot. And hopefully they did too. Um, and so for me, this was uh, one of the first times I've given directions over Zoom on how to um, create the, the piece. Um, and so I thought that this, the way in which we had the discussions were really helpful um, because now I was like, it makes you realize that as you're touching it, or as they're touching it, uh, part of you goes into it. So when I would create these, I would use um, different sift types of sifters. And um, when I would, I would tell them to create the edge to go in and with a little brush and just take every little bit away, right? Um, but I wasn't able to be there, right? So um, what I always learned every time I would do these, these mounds so in a sense, it's, it doesn't look like a line, but all it is is the templates spread out more. So going from very thin in the front of the exhibition to towards the center of the exhibition being separated and becoming more of a landform. And of course, you know, in this case, this piece is up on a platform. Um, many times when I do it, it's on the floor where it's not unusual for people to ex to walk into it. And I'm not sure what their experience was in the exhibition with the line in the entrance to uh, the exhibition, but I had warned them that uh, there's a pretty good chance that they might have to remake that line uh, for the duration of the exhibition. So I'm not sure how that, that came about. Um, this, uh, goes into and int introduces you to the piece that's uh, in Chicago right now. And uh, this is the, um, uh, it's called Hidden Crater and it's influenced by the Chesapeake Bay Hidden Crater um, in uh, Virginia uh, area. I was doing an exhibition in uh, um, Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. And one of the professors during lunch had said, oh, we have a big splat. And they, I had never heard of this thing before, um, but basically it's, it's hidden. Um, so the only way uh, we know that it exists is through scientists uh, drilling uh, and taking uh, information from drilling uh, over 30 years and kind of making their own diagram. And so what I did is I took that diagram and didn't really trace it, but reinterpreted it and had it laser, uh, my version laser cut into plywood and then made these, uh, these structures, uh, which would become an object like this. And then I would take photographs of them. Next slide. And, uh, and I had a studio assistant um, put these together with, you know, together we would work 
and kind of overlap them. I wanted them to feel like a, a fetus in a sense. And I wanted them, uh, this was always meant to be very small. Uh, ideally, seeing it on your uh, cell phone is really the ideal. Um, and we can go to the next. And then I will take those and reinterpret them in uh, ink drawings. Um, so now I'm using the source material from the screen as uh, for the drawings. Um, so I think that's it uh, for today. Thank you, Michael. Um, Thank you. Yeah, very different, very different from Cheryl, but such a nice perspective. And one of the things that you touched on also is this idea of the trust needed for the exhibition, considering that none of us, uh, curators and artists included, were necessarily able to cross borders and um, mm -hmm. install or be there as we usually are to install works and have all of the tactility of being in a space. Um, and Hesseholt and Malvang, the the artist duo um, that are joining us here from, from Copenhagen, are, are certainly a testament to that and what we've been able to do um, remotely, even though uh, we're unable to come to Chicago. And so I, I'm gonna turn it over to them to present on their work and you know hopefully also touch upon the, the necessary transformations that had to take place from their performative practice into video. Yes, yeah. Thank you, thank Stephanie, you, Stephanie and uh, Michael. I can say to you, it, it looks amazing in uh, Malmö. It was really uh, beautiful in the entrance and also in the exhibition part. So you could be happy about that, I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we are Sophie and Vivica, um, and we have been working together since '99, where we met at Art Academy, and ever since we have worked together uh, doing all projects together. Uh, just a little introduction, we work with performance, installation, sculptures, uh, research and site-specific works, large-scale projects and um, very, very often in public space. Um, and um, you could say that uh, what we're working with, yeah, I think for us it's a response to the world around us. Um, that's what we're working with, uh, to do this response, giving that response uh, back. It, it is important for us to communicate and relate, relate also to, to the specific site that we are doing a project in. Um, it's for us very important to be out where people are, um, out in the world. Um, it's a natural thing for us when we start up a project, uh, when we are invited or something, we, we start up with uh, looking uh, at the site outside, for example, a museum or art hall. Um, it's more kind of interesting for us to start out there to find out who are the people living there, who are the, the viewers who are, yeah, who's living there, basically. And, um, and uh, then, of course, we do projects inside as well, but it's often also have an outside side uh, part of uh, an, a project. Uh, for example, it could be a flagpole. We're always um, looking for flagpoles around the world, so that's uh, that could be one what's one starting point. Um, yeah. I'll say art matters, so, so we can do... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can uh, tell hello. about... Uh, we are, we're going to show three projects today. And the first one here that you see is not in the show, um, but it was a performance back in 2018 that was called For a Better Tomorrow. Uh, it was in uh, Manifesta in Palermo in Italy. And that's a very special place because in Palermo, the immigrants um, from the Mediterranean Sea will enter the, the harbor. Um, so we were quite inspired of being in this um, place. Um, we were doing a performance, a durational performance that took two hours. Uh, in the baking sun in the morning, um, but the day before, 
we um, prepare this rectangle um, of the earth, of the soil. Um, so in the preparation phase, uh, we used four hours just connecting with the, the earth. We were cutting with small scissors all the grass away, taking away all the garbage and cigarettes and everything from this public uh, place. So it felt like we were um, caring for this place. Um, and it helped us very much the next day that we felt welcome and safe and yeah, in connection with this place. Um, that is something that has become more and more important for us in the in the coming years to work directly on um, on the ground. Um, the performance day was uh, um, or the performance was inspired by the Buddhist Saint Mandalas, where the Buddhist monks um, uh, spread saint in very intricate uh, patterns for for a long time and while they are finished uh, when they are finished they destroy the mandala again to kind of you could say show the impermanence of the material world or for me it's about cherishing the moment and the now and what we have um, so that was really inspiring for us the pattern that we were building up, um, yeah, here you can see, this is the last picture, but here you can see that we also um, brushed it, the pattern away after we finished it. Um, but the pattern, if you could go back a little with the slide, yeah, please. Um, here you can see the pattern, it's um, a flag, a big flag pattern, but it's um, made of different flag designs that we have combined uh, and then we have these um, scale of earth colors or even maybe skin tones it could also be that we mix together to make this new um, collective flag we see it as a collective flag um, and we see this kind of works that we do as symbolic acts as healing acts you could say. Yeah, I think that's enough about this project. So mm -hmm. let's continue with the next project. Thank you. Yeah, we actually were allowed to go to Sweden. It was not easy, but we in the end, we, we managed to go. Uh, so we went uh, to Malmö. The exhibition should open in, was it January? January, I think, yeah. And we went there in February, a cold winter day uh, over there. and. Um, we uh, we did this uh, long um, installation, 70 meters. It ended up with um, a performance outside on the the rampart. We had 1,200 red bricks. Um, um, yeah, and the red bricks you can see in the the castle, the old castle. You can see at this picture, but uh, the Malmö Art, Art Museum is in the building behind. Um, so the red bricks connect with the, the, the building. Um, it, was, um, it was a cold day and uh, for us it was important to be out there, even though it was uh, rough and the hill was muddy and it was yeah difficult to do this project um, on this steep hill. But uh, it was important to do it, even though there was this uh, pandemic going on, because actually a lot of people went, uh, came through, uh, passed by, um, and that was kind of nice to communicate with on the other side of the water um, to try to speak up um, something. And what we are, we'll be, we're building up this sentence: um, "Please rest in peace." But we shall not repeat the error. Uh, it's a sentence uh, that is uh, from the Hiroshima monument for the victims of the atomic bomb in 1945. Um, we have a, it's a sentence that we have been working with in other projects. So it's for me, for us, it's very important to bring it out there as well. Um, 
we like it because it talks to our ancestors, um, kind of activating the past, the present, and um, also talk to the future. Uh, we are interested in this history and how to how it tends to repeat itself. So kind of uh, in the sentence saying that we promise the answers that, that we will not repeat uh, the mistakes of the past, we might now look for new mistakes. Um, yeah. Uh, another, th another thing to add to this project is the, the, the red bricks that we use in this project is, um, is uh, used back in the days uh, it's not the same type we have now, uh, it's more slim, it's just a little detail, but it was the, the bricks that were used uh, when Denmark colonized the West Indies. Um, as a reference to the past, uh, they, they uh, were using it for the, um, the ballast in, uh, for the... Um, yeah, ballast. Ballast in the ships. Yeah, in the slave ships. In the slave ships. Uh, yeah. So you can actually find these uh, old bricks in, in the West Indies now. Yeah. Yeah. Next slide, please. Uh, this last project we are showing today is um, the, the little film we just made uh, to be shown at the LED truck uh, around in Chicago. Um, Again, we needed to connect with the site. <laughs> and uh, uh, as you know, there's a travel ban, so we were not able to go to the US, uh, to Chicago, to do something there. Um, so we decided to be there in the digital world, in cyberspace. Um, what you see behind us here is uh, Chicago. Uh, it's uh, a bit of a dystopian uh, kind of um, cityscape um, and we are these uh, two uh, fools. Uh, the title is uh, Two Fools in Town. Um, we, were, we are really happy about being the two fools. Um, they are inspired of course uh, by the, the old jester from back in the um, European kingdoms where the jester was employed by the, the king and was actually supposed to tell the king the truth about how the people felt about the king and the politics going on and so on. So for us, it's a figure that is pretty much um, the artist. Um, it's a... Uh, we see the artist and the fool as somebody trying to uh, talk to the world about what's going on, about telling the truth. And still it's a, a figure that can be extremely ambiguous, um, talking in tongues and, and even be contradictory. So for us, it's a very free space to talk about um, what's going on, what's on our minds. Um, uh, yeah, I guess that's, let me see in my notes, um, they are even uh, encouraging people to act um, in, this, uh, in this piece that's very much about the theme of the show, the, the sustainable societies uh, for the future. Do you have anything to add here? No? no? I then I think, I don't know if there's one more slide or we are through. Oh, that's it. Otherwise, we are finished. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. I mean, the the relationship that each of you have to land art and site and place and sort of traversing through different environments is really beautiful to see. And I'm I'm grateful also that we could see the outside of the Malmo Art Museum within your work because you know something that um, maybe not a lot of people know is that it's the museum is hosted in a former castle. And so it is surrounded by this moat that um, was meant to pe keep people out um, or protect those who were inside. And so there's this interesting relationship to protection and safety. Um, but what I love about your work in this exhibition is that it also guides people in 
Um, so it, it really does do both. And so the next uh, presentation that we're going to have before we open into a group discussion, which will be followed by um, the performative work and video documentation of Hesselholt and Melvang's piece at the Malma Art Museum. So for anybody that wants to stay on after the panel, you'll be able to see that screening. Um, so we're going to turn is reverse the order to entropy and optimism. And Laura, you really talk about um, the unique uh, sites, artist-run sites and spaces in Detroit that have um, given the city such cultural value um, and also how those things have shifted in, in recent years. And so I will pass it over to you um, to talk more about your text within the book. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Laura Mott. I'm the chief curator at Cranbrook Art Museum, and I wrote um, a contribution for the book. Uh, one of the things I really focus on in that text is about the importance of ground up narratives being told about the city of Detroit. There is a uh, the city of Detroit is often really seen as a poster child for the failure of capitalism. Um, and uh, there's a lot of media attention. There's lots of uh, stories told about a Detroit that actually don't come from the city. And I think that the artists of Detroit actually offer a very unique way of telling these ground up narratives. Um, I'm going to focus on one artistic project um, that I undertook an, in collaboration with the artist Scott Hawking, um, which I think really demonstrates the kind of work that's happening in the city. Um, can I have my first slide? So our project really began with uh, this image. Um, this is an image that you'll see often in uh, accompanying the like history of the 19th century of America and the American West. Um, it's of two men standing uh, next to a huge pile of bison skulls. Uh, this is an image that usually accompanies the story about how the government led the decimation of Native Americans through the slaughter of bison, which was such an important um, part of, uh, of sustaining their societies. Um, but what's fascinating was Scott Hawking um, discovered that this image was actually taken in Detroit. Um, Detroit is where they sent all of these bones to be crushed and processed into industrial paint. Um, a paint called Bone Black. So this was a really exciting discovery for us. Scott is really like a, an informal Detroit, a Detroit historian. Um, so the beginning of um, the, this commission that we undertook was uh, starting with this photograph. Um, can you move the next slide, please? Also, the site where we were going to do this massive installation was in a, in a large abandoned uh, factory on the Detroit River. Um, the city of Detroit actually, and um, the Detroit means straight in French. Um, so the river was really the uh, source of travel and economy at the beginning of the history of the city. Um, people really associate Detroit with the automotive industry. Uh, but since our kind of source image was really going back to this time period of Detroit before the automotive industry, um, we wanted to kind of really uh, navigate that history and, and think through um, uh, this relationship to the water. Can you go to the next slide? Uh, so here we have this photograph, this history of economy um, and within the city, uh, but also uh, this relationship to the water. And one of the things that Scott Hawking had been undertaking for two decades was photographing these abandoned boats throughout the city. Um, it's a kind of the strange phenomenon, a little surreal. You'll see a lot of abandoned boats in the city, in part because it costs money to actually dispo properly dispose of a boat. So people, primarily from the suburbs, um, go to the city and just use it as a dumping ground. Um, so we were very interested in kind of undertaking uh, th these ideas and then also really asking ourselves the question, what are the contemporary schools today um, of the city? Um, so this led to this installation, which is um, a, a primer about the size of an American football field. Um, and this is kind of how, what resulted in the combining of these different like histories together, um, as well as just the reality that we're living with in the city. So um, Scott collected about over 30 boats and created this um, 
kind of ghost fleet um, within this uh, abandoned factory. In addition, uh, he used the bone black pigment. Um, what was also really amazing that we discovered through the process of creating this project is that um, that paint, that bone black paint and the business that was running that, crushing those bison skulls in the, 19, the late 19th century was still operating um, in the city of Detroit today of all the failed economies and all these um, uh, incredible uh, like stories of, of uh, businesses closing down and abandonment, this was something that continued on. So we actually use the bone black pigment as, um, as a material within the installation. So um, this was something that we had viewers to kind of see. It was also a way we are really revealing these histories um, within the museum. Um, uh, we had painted um, the, the wall bone black with the, the history of that image. But also, I think that our institutions are itinerant and conditional. So in many ways, we this space is the institution and the, the extension of what we're doing in the museum. Um, Scott then continued to uh, augment and change the installation um, through a series of photographs, which is how it survives today. You can go to the next slide. And we can stop here. So I think it's really uh, important that one of the things that we really undertake as a community and an artistic community is we talk about acts of care quite a bit um, within the context of Detroit. Um, this is also something that is durational. Um, that's, that's something that we feel like we want to uh, participate in. And that's something even within the artistic community when we talk about the, the projects that we undertake. So part of the, how this project ended was um, properly disposing of all the boats um, and, and paying for that to happen because um, that was a way that we could actually make a contribution um, beyond just research and imagination. So just, uh, just to kind of like finally kind of situate this project, um, this project was part of a large scale uh, exhibition and public art series called Landlord Colors on Art, Economy and Materiality um, in 2019. So there is a book that um, talks about this project, but also many others um, that uh, were, were undertaken. So that's, uh, that's it for my presentation. Thank you, Laura Thank you. and um, yeah, it's so nice to have your contribution in in the book as well, which really is this companion piece to the exhibition and, you know, a, a facet of the exhibition itself. And one of the most interesting challenges, I think, for all of us that were working on sustainable societies for the future was thinking through how to communicate an exhibition project, um, of course, without travel, but also that responds to the localities that originally inspired the idea. And so having having such an in-depth contribution uh, from Detroit and Chicago, which were really the two American cities that uh, Kirsa Junga Stevensborg, um, who was my co-curator, and Anna Thomason from the Malmo Art Museum were, were looking at. So, uh, I think it really brings it all together. Uh, I wanted to open, I guess, for a little bit of a group discussion between the artists. Um, some of you are meeting for the first time over over this and over this platform right now, unfortunately, um, where we would have all met in person together. And just see if there were any particular elements of of projects um of the projects that were presented that really resonated for you within your own work or brought up some some ideas uh, surrounding inside versus outside um with and with a, within the environment but also without the environment and maybe cheryl we can start with you just to see um if there were any new ideas that you um, discovered about your own practice through this You're muted. Um, oh, there we go. Perfect. Oh, you're good. Oh, I really thanks. I really enjoyed hearing um, from the other artists talk more specifically about their works. And you know, right away, Michael, when I saw yours with that coastal line, you know, just that as a as a frame, as a record, as a, a story keeper, um, you know, it wasn't too long ago that I had seen an aerial image of 
um, Lake Michigan and them and talking about how much that has receded and shifted and just the poetics of it in that space to really look at it formally as this line and um, the connection it has to the to the body and and I always think of you know it's my motto in life of, of that we are all water but I think that mediating line between both the water and then the the solid. Um, raised surface. It's such a beautiful line to understand too, the fragility of sustainability and how that that can be mapped. And um, I think too, then the way that you guys were working outside of Melmo, really highlighting it as this um, sort of protective space and that as a surface and really by bringing language to it, you know, I think about how you guys are carrying that phrase and uh, Maya Angelou stating that, you know, you string a few words together and you can start a war, you know, and you can end a war and we could, you know, how important those words are and how we carry them. And, you know, I think it's interesting. I think about that phrase, I think about um, the phrase, be the change you want to see and where, you know, between those, the, you know, I was, I was noting between thinking about these, everything as a frame and a frame really navigating between the interior and exterior and how that also then marks a distance between intimacy and distance. And, you know, both of these phrases working then as a way of um, kind of this intimate experience of change. And then also where is that at, at a distance and how do we measure and navigate that line? Just like how that line, Michael, you're using keeps shifting and how are we, that line is, is evidence of a change and how are we paying attention to that? Thanks. Yeah, I also um, noticed, uh, which was very striking for me in both of your two, Michael and uh, Cheryl's uh, project, the, what was striking to me was that you were really uh, caring, actually, or it's like with this young man and with the, the coastline, it's this, you know, really putting your attentions very closely to something makes it really alive to the rest of us it's um something you the coastline you i think we're just having a slight connection issue here one moment Hey, the joys of technology give us one moment <laughs> <laughs> maybe michael we can uh we can go over to you until certainly uh, sophie and yeah. vivica can join again okay uh yeah i was really excited to see all the projects um the, their performance with making that flag on the ground uh i really connected to and then uh, seeing the documentation of uh, of the boats in that um, space uh, was extremely powerful uh, to me, um, it, mainly because of personal connections to the image of a boat and and what that means with water. But um, and then how that related to. Um, uh, the video of um, of the of the man being followed, um, I was relating to just being inside that building with the boats, and then Cheryl's uh, video. Uh, there was a grittiness to both that kind of made me shake a little bit um, in different ways, um, and I thought that uh, Scott Hawking's uh, photographs. Um, especially documenting the transition uh, from the beginning to the end, and even the way in which you talked about um, ending the performance by, um, you know, discarding them in a respectful manner. You know, because you can't help but think about someone made those boats, someone lived in those boats, someone moved, you know, ex ex had experience in those boats. Um, and it's a form that's used quite often. So I, I just, I've learned a lot today. Um, so thank you. 
Yeah. And this idea also of, you know, futurity and looking forward, I think is so interesting because each each of the artists here were working independently from one another really on this collaborative exhibition project but the certain formal elements that we can tie together just as simply as water is something that i don't think we would have um, been able to anticipate or know and laura i wanted to bring it back actually to how your essay begins in the book um, which is Right now, it is October 2020. You, dear reader, live in the future and know how some of this ends. And I don't know if we've, if we've seen the end of it yet, but certainly things have changed a lot since last October. Yeah, I mean, I think when I, I in my essay, I write that I'm being, I'm being tasked to talk about sustainability, but I'm living in a very dystopic moment. So this was before the American election um, had happened. It was before we had a vaccine. So it was really kind of in the eye of the storm <laughs> when you really start to see how um, fragile our societies are. Um, but at the same time, I, I talked about uh, how you can actually summon up optimism. Um, and Detroit's a great example of that because I think it's a it's a city that's undergone just an enormous amount of uh, challenges and difficulties um, uh, when it comes to uh, economy, um, precarity of, of uh, precarity of life. Um, we have just systemic racial issues that continue to identify um, strongly what Detroit is. And, um, at the same time, uh, this is the moment to summon those conversations forth, right? And so as we've all been, I think, faced with, um, you know, with uh, limitations, with uh, these, these ideas of, of our own mortality in such a real way, um, I think it makes us look very closely at the systems we have in place, um, the societies that we live in. Yeah, and I think it will only, you know, the, the beauty of this exhibition project also is that it's based on so many questions um, that will only continue to become, unfortunately, more relevant, but perhaps also resolved uh, in the, as we look forward to the future. Um, so I know that Hessel Holt and Melvang are just um, waiting to get back on screen and we have a performance uh, of theirs that we will be screening and they're, they're logging in shortly. I wanted to take a moment to uh, thank all of you for your contributions to the show and to this conversation now. And I think uh, just in the interest of time, we're, we're going to start screening the film um, and hopefully Sophie and Vibika can can join me at the end of that uh, screening but until then uh, thank you Cheryl Michael and Laura so much for your contributions thank you thank you it was, it was a pleasure to be, see all of your presentations
Jag tar det på kameran också. Vad tar du? Men nu är vi på så vi tittar. Är de på E? Och sen så får vi tänka på vad är det kommer så vi kan titta på pinnen. Then 10 minutes, 10 centimeters. Okay. Yeah, 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 no, no, no. Det vil sige, passer den nogenlunde der? Godt.
So for those of you just joining in, uh, what you were just viewing was a film work um, that was made out of Hesseholt and Melvang's performance called Please Rest in Peace, for We Shall Not Repeat the Error from 2021, which was just um, unveiled earlier this year at the Melmo Art Museum in Sweden. And we have Sophie and Vibika with us here uh, from Hesseholt and Melvang, the uh, artistic duo and they are joining in from Copenhagen and we're just part of the previous panel um, yeah. but unfortunately we, will leave now. we fell out so now we, are in, <laughs> now we are leaving so thank you now you're... <laughs> Bye. Oh, thank you no. you're here you. yeah we are <laughs> Okay, well, um, I just wanted to read a little bit about this um, video before we screen for the remainder of the hour um, and give a little bit of context for those that um, were not able to hear from the artists about what the uh, subject of the work is. So the title is Please Rest in Peace for We Shall Not Repeat the Error. It is a performative video work from 2021. Enacted as a durational event, the work is comprised of performers relocating a series of traditional Flensburg bricks characterized by their slender, more elegant appearance. Through the gesture of this spelling, the text, bricks, and performers' bodies bring together two violent histories. Perhaps most recognizably is the referent of the phrase, which is borrowed from and translated into English from the epitaph on the Flame of Peace Memorial in Hiroshima that acknowledges the victims of the atomic bomb deployed by US forces in August of 1945. The literal translation of the original text that was written by Tadayoshi Seika was also given an English correlative. The translation originally had read, let all the souls here rest in peace, for we shall not repeat the evil. The plaque in English was not installed until 1983, and this original translation, which exchanges evil and error, becomes particularly significant uh, towards the past uses of the bricks themselves, which the artists employ. Widespread throughout the Baltic Sea region, the Flensburg brick is now more commonly known for having the exterior of a station building uh, throughout Denmark. Um, and though it is shrouded in this banal familiarity, the unchanged design of the fabrication for the units were also used as ballasts for Danish slave ships to the West Indies. The question becomes what stands and what falls, evil and error are not the same, and though through this mistranslation and reappropriation, they coexist even still today. So now we will screen, please rest in peace for we shall not repeat the error and be back with panels as part of the Sustainable Societies for the Future Symposium at 7 p.m. Central Eastern Central European time and um, in 45 minutes for everyone else that is joining without having to do time changes.
Nu tar du. Men nu är vi på så vi tittar. Är de på E? Och sen så får vi tänka på vad är ett kompis. Vi kan titta på Okay, e then 10 minutes, 10 centimeters. Okay. Yeah, 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 no, no, no. Det vil sige, passer den nogenlunde der? Godt.
Nu tar du. Men nu är vi på så vi tittar. Är de på er? Och sen så får vi tänka på vad är ett kompis, vi kan ju sitta på pinnen. Okay, e then 10 minutes, 10 centimeters. Yeah, 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 no, no, no. Det vil sige, passer den nogenlunde der? Godt.
Nu tar du. Men nu är vi på så vi tittar. Sen så får vi tänka på vad är det kommer så vi kan titta på Okay, e then 10 minutes, 10 centimeters. Yeah, 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 no, no, no. Det vil sige, passer nogenlunde der? Godt.
Nu tar du. Men nu är vi på så vi tittar. Sen så får vi tänka på vad är det kommer så vi kan titta på Okay, e then 10 minutes, 10 centimeters. Okay. Yeah, 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 no, no, no. Det vil sige, passer den nogenlunde der? Godt.
Vad tar du? Men nu är vi på så vi tittar. Är de på ägg? Sen så får vi tänka på vad ett kommer så vi kan titta på filmen. Then 10 minutes, 10 centimeters. Okay. Yeah, 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 no, no, no.
we just have 150 from here. Ja, det er der præcis, Helena. Ja, det er sådan noget lunde der. Godt. Hello everyone and welcome to the continuation of the Sustainable Societies for the Future Symposium. Um, it is my pleasure to be hosting this final conversation after the two-day program, which is all visible and archived at program.expochicago.com. Um, today we are being joined for our last discussion by a partner program that is presented in partnership with the Chicago Architecture Biennial. And while it is not an official program of Sustainable Societies for the Future, we're thrilled to be partnering with CAB in order to present a project by Soil Lab that is really close to the ethos of sustainable societies for the future and um yeah we're thrilled to be welcoming all of the panelists from various parts of the world today um, so maria and evelyn from soil lab will be speaking on behalf of the project and joined by ellen bray who is with the danish arts foundation in the architecture department as well <clears throat> thank you all so much for being here with me and part of the project. Um, I wanted to allow um, each of you to sort of give a little bit of an introduction about 
Soil Lab and the amazing installation that is on view in Chicago at the moment as part of the Chicago Architecture Biennial. And then from there present um, a little bit about the project to our audience, which is um, mostly from the contemporary art world and perhaps unfamiliar with the work that you all have done for the biennial. And um, we'll open into a brief conversation following. Um, so I'll pass it off to um, maybe you first, Ellen, to, to sort of set up the involvement of how this project came to be on behalf of the Danish Arts Foundation um, and in partnership with the Chicago Architecture Biennial and then to Evelyn and Maria. Yes, hello everyone. I uh, would be happy to, to do that uh, short introduction. Um, actually, this is the second time that the Danish Arts Foundation um, contribute to the uh, Chicago Architecture Biennial. And um, in some ways, we are standing on the shoulders of those uh, uh, experiences we made uh, two years ago. Um, but I have to start uh, a bit uh, far from Chicago, actually in, in Venice, um, because coming from Europe, the Venice uh, Architecture Biennial is some kind of a, a shared uh, a point of reference. Yet it is also a quite old institution and Denmark has been taking part uh, in the Venice Architecture Biennial for very, very long. And we have a pavilion there that is um, always hosting the Danish contribution. So in, in many ways, um, um, taking part in that context is very sort of uh, constrained. Uh, it's constrained by the building, it's constrained by the um, the institutions that always are involved and we wanted from this uh, uh, Danish Arts Foundation's Committee for Architecture to test new ground and we have for long been looking towards uh, Chicago and the, um, the very young biennial um, so from us it was from the very first uh, step really important not to be in the Chicago biennial building next to the Millennium Park, but actually to step out in the open public space and not just come and show something, but come and take part in a joint uh, learning process. So two years ago, um, the um, Committee for Architecture commissioned uh, a project called the Capit Patch project, uh, bring in 10,000 capitates in um, in the Garfield uh, Park and having collaborations with, with the many local uh, associations and, uh, and, and persons, both public and, and, and private. And we wanted to try to work from there onwards. And then this uh, thing about the open, uh, the vacant lots uh, came around and we also had a joint partner from the Danish Arts Foundation's uh, part. Uh, because the uh, committee for design and and craft, they would really like to to join us in in this um, in this collaboration. So it became sort of a, a multiple collaboration project because one thing is the two uh, committees, arts and craft on the one hand, and the one for architecture, which I'm chairing on the other hand, and then we tapped into a collaboration with the Chicago Architecture Biennial itself. Um, so that was basically the, the starting point. And then the second sort of uh, dimension to this uh, collaborational um, approach was to require the, 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 the artists, the architects, the designers that would sort of win the open call from our side to tap into uh, the local communities uh, being present uh, at this particular site. And, and so that is sort of the point of departure, uh, the ambitions that were sort of uh, paving the ground for the project that we now see. Excellent. And, you know, we're going to certainly delve more into the specificity of the site for Soil Lab, which is taking place in the North Lawndale neighborhood of Chicago. Um, and 
you know, all of the facets that, that that carries with it. And of course, the the symposium that we're hosting today is on sustainability. And uh, one of, I think, the nicest facets of this project, too, is the social sustainability and reliance on partnerships and uh, local partners, in addition to presenting the international work of, of these Danish architects and designers. Um, so that's a great introduction, Ellen. Thank you. And I'll, I'll pass it off to Soyolab now, who I think has a presentation as well. We do, we do. Let's see if it works. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you, Ellen. It's lovely to be here today. Do you see the presentation? <clears throat> and do you hear me? We hear you, we see a green screen. You see a green screen. Let's try. No. Let's see. I these are the joys this. of hosting. Uh, these are the yes. joys of hosting programs across uh, four different I countries. See, see. Oh, here we go. We're good. <laughs> Super. We're good. Here we go, here we go. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Ellen, for that uh, introduction. Um, I am Maria and part of the Soil Lab team together with Eileen. Uh, I'm currently located in Copenhagen. I'm, and Eileen, where are you? <laughs> I'm currently in the Swiss Alps on a little holiday after uh, a very long time in Chicago, but I'm um, really happy to be joining you today. <laughs> And um, we will we will kind of be diving into what Soil Lab is doing and what we are currently doing as part of the Chicago Architecture Biennial. First off, we want to introduce you kind of to the full team, even though it's only two of us who are here today. But um, we are two designers and architects located in Copenhagen, Denmark, me. Maria and Anna Dorde Vester, who's an architect. And then we are Eileen Kasahi and uh, James Martin, who's both uh, architects located in Dublin, Ireland. And we're a collective group that um, met around our fascination for soil and bricks uh, in this project. Um, so here we just see back in an overview. Sorry, Maria, continue. There's a delay here. Go ahead. No. Um, you you go ahead, Eileen. Uh, so back in back in December, we um, entered a competition, an open competition um, that the Danish Arts Foundation organised. And Anna Dorda, who James and I had studied or did a master's with in Aarhus, contacted us and said, hey, would you be interested in entering this open call? Uh, so we did. And Anna Dorda had an idea to begin with a ceramic studio. So looking here at the image, you see back to the city of Chicago and immediately in front, you see our competition entry, which was to have an outdoor studio space in the area community of North Lawndale. And I think just to also continue what Ellen said, what really fascinated us about this open call was uh, essentially what, what Ellen is saying that this biannual with the theme of the available city seemed to be something different than the traditional biannuals where uh, pavilions and um, uh, kind of uh, huge installations uh, uh, for a short period of time would represent a national contribution to the biannual. Nothing wrong with that, but what we really found interesting about this specific open call was that the Chicago Architecture Biannual really had an ambition to activate the city and move architecture, move experiments into areas and into empty lots where uh, we would present uh, new proposals to the people that essentially will be living with this architecture. I think it's important to say that, I mean, that's a, a super ambitious uh, idea 
for for a biennial and I think that's really what we're, we were excited about entering this competition with um, as Maria st said biennials are often architects talking to other architects which is fine and, and also needs to happen but but there was a real opportunity here particularly in the middle of a pandemic uh, to look to these areas that are most under underserved and could could really benefit from this talent and energy and funds uh, so here we're looking at an aerial view uh, of our site in North Rondale. Uh, the T-shaped concrete slab sort of in the centre of your screen was the very um, beginning. And maybe it's important to say originally we were two sites up on a greenfield site, um, but later we, we, we discovered that we couldn't um, penetrate the ground, which we might talk about in a little while. Um, but our site is the T slab that you see in the centre in the centre of the screen. So the block has very many vacant lots um, on it, which isn't unusual in these areas. There's 10,000 um, vacant lots in the west and south um, of Chicago, which, which yeah, makes up the atmosphere of, of these places that, you know, it's, it's very much part of the fabric that you have buildings and then you have, you have nothing and then you'll have more buildings so that that's sort of the context immediate context of where we are we're opposite a car wash and then we have a uh, wyman a uh, bicycle container to the north which isn't on this plan but you, you're going to get an idea of of the environment that we're coming into as a starting point just uh, zooming back a little to our um our uh, initial proposal to the the open uh, open call we have the the combination of the strong heritage of and the use of bricks in, in both uh, Copenhagen and Chicago such a uh, joint finding a way to actually be working with the brick um, as a physical form but also in kind of a terminology uh, of a building block saying that a brick is not only a singular brick but it can also create something uh, as a whole yeah so just analyzing the and acknowledging the material culture in both chicago and copenhagen was was very much where this project um where, where it was born So, so here we have uh, before we we arrived, our our uh, study in advance was very much laptop based and um, roaming the streets and Google Earth. But you can you can see from three streets that we that we visited um, that there is this culture also in North Lawndale um, as part of Chicago with beautiful salmon coloured um, bricks and ceramic tiles. So this embedded material. Um, knowledge and culture exists within the community that we were that we were landing ourselves in we um just to kind of uh, also take you into some other analysis that we of course did was kind of to compare the uh American and the Danish brick culture, but also kind of realizing that Chicago itself has itself has a very uh, strong culture of building in bricks. We could see it on our our Google Maps uh, research because we were so limited and weren't able to travel. But what we discovered was that Chicago actually had their completely own uh, brick uh, with different dimensions that differs from the standard American brick and naturally also differs from the Danish brick. So we were kind of diving into the details, into a very small scale of what is what is our different heritage and what can still be compared. So here, I guess you, you see our competition entry where we proposed building on that material culture, looking at brick, but also questioning the use of brick and how sustainable that is um, now in 2021. Uh, so what we have proposed here is, is a construction workshop um, using different types of soil. So you have raw 
soil that is unfired um, for the rammed earth that you see at the back. And then there are these fired bricks that are in the experiment area in the center. And then the, the plinth that runs around the perimeter of the of the site would be would be fired bricks that, that were the beginning of the project. So it was really uh, a workshop space that that acknowledged history, but also began to question the position of brick and celebrating the craft um, of these beautiful uh, materials that both both cities have. And we really wanted to create an open space. So this is, I mean, an, an, an open workshop uh, where we kind of imagined people uh, in the community and locals passing by the site, even during the build up and kind of becoming interested and curious as to what is going on. Uh, and as you might see on the top of, uh, of the the visualization is that we had imagined to excavate uh, and, and dig soil directly on the site. Unfortunately, that was one of our first big challenges that we met in this project was that we were not uh, able to, uh, to uh, take soil directly from the site to build something new. So that was a challenge that we really had to solve moving forward in the process. And I think it's something that uh, really enriched the project, um, but I guess we'll discuss that in, in a little while, why we couldn't penetrate. You call yourself soil lab as a, as a soil laboratory, but you don't really understand um, the, yeah, the challenges that, that lie ahead. Uh, so here we have a, an overview of, of the workshop space, the outside workshop space and the, the center room that you see 24 meters squared. So that's where the kiln is housed and that's the only enclosed space. So it has a roof and, and four walls. And then to the east of that, you see the workshop area that has a canopy over it. Uh, that you enter from Pulaski Road um, to the east. And then there's an experimentation area to the west. So the idea really was that this, this is a laboratory uh, where uh, people can see what's happening as they're passing by and there's an, an opening, an open welcoming environment um, during the construction and also when the space was made. And you begin to see here how the, the timber elements interact with the round earth. Um, but we'll, we'll come to that in a little while. So that's just a, an, an axonometric of the space as we were designing. Um, in the beginning, we, we, we kind of uh, had the need to uh, uh, categorize uh, what types of crafts and what type of architectural methods that we were introducing uh, in this project and essentially introducing to the local community that we, we would later ask to engage in these processes. Um, all of us has a different experience from our previous work that we were able to integrate into this process. And as you see here from this illustration, it, it simply, uh, it simply, simply indica indicates the elements that we're working with. We're working with prefabricated bricks as, as the plinth or the foundation, uh, for our construction and for our space. It's in a height that is a uh, seat height. So you would, you could see it as a room, but you could also see it as a bench or a seating area, uh, defining the overall workshop space. Oh, sorry. Um, then we move on to round earth elements that we, as, as I, Aline and I both mentioned, that we had expected to excavate from, from the site and had to find alternative solution later on, but kind of, um, stamping soil in, in a very specific, uh, mixture of components of, uh, gravel and sand and, and uh, clay into this uh, wooden formwork that you see on top of the of the rammed earth elements and then you see a ceramic tile that has been extruded from a, a 
uh, industrial extrusion machine, a brick making machine essentially, but it's a large ceramic tile that essentially will top off uh, this, the rammed earth walls, but also top off the brick, brick plinth to form a seat. And these are all Maybe it's uh, good. finished by hand. Maybe it's good just at this point, Maria, before we go on to the next slide, that that this is really um, all of the the craft and the the building techniques that we've that we've um, utilized. But the bottom the bottom plinth was was made by masons, brick masons, skilled brick masons, and then the the timber work for the formwork that you see. And the other carpentry elements um, in the project were were made by a local um, carpentry. Um, um, they were like a school of uh, yeah, where they, you you train apprentices to become carpenters. So there was there was two skilled laborers, and also um, the rammed earth was then us um, soil lab with with the community. So just to understand the different crafts and the the team was a lot bigger um, than than the four of us. Um, and I think that 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 skill of existing uh, masons and carpentry and also the ceramic tiles that came from from Denmark added to the overall sort of collaboration and also discussion um, when we were on site, uh, learning from those who have experience and then an openness of people who are learning together. So you can see in, sort of an artist impression. Yeah, go ahead, Maria. Sorry, I'm, I have a delay again. Um, in I think May and June, we uh, still not go to Chicago. So in this case, we we started to doing the experiments um, because this was very important for us because we too were uh, very but newbies in this process. We had not necessarily worked large scale with uh, rammed earth and, and with the components of soil. Um, so we decided to do experiments uh, locally in Denmark and share it uh, uh, with uh, our community groups in Chicago. Uh, this was also for us to be able to get an idea of what we were actually asking people to do when uh, stepping in uh, to the site in Chicago. So here we are working on uh, some soil tests um, with uh, yes, uh, the different components. Yeah, so essentially with that, that month that we spent all together in Copenhagen was, was the beginning of understanding the construction technique, as Maria said, that we would be asking the community to do. And it was a really important um, month. We, we built the formwork ourselves and we also um, just began to understand the components of, of soil and the, the clay um, values necessary um, to, to make round earth. We also tried to uh, visit the uh, local ceramic workshop who, who works with uh, extruding bricks and, and kind of figured out how this process could be integrated both on our site and also just how we could uh, have people interact with the material. We were uh, experimenting with the soft clay, but also experimenting with uh, bricks in in kind of the band that we would lay out uh, these. Uh, the so this was us gaining the knowledge before um, before engaging. And he, our uh, local Danish masons uh, uh, teaching us how to. To uh, how to form the brick plinth. Here you see. Uh, you go ahead. 
yeah, there's a delay. Apologies. So I think the 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 month of of testing in in Copenhagen um, really gave us an understanding of actually the the physicality um, that was necessary in in lifting the soil into the formwork and in ramming for for four hours. But what it did help to do is scale the project and what was actually possible in the time that we had. So we had one month for construction in Chicago and we really understood the limits of what was possible in a day and how many people you need needed to, to make one one formwork. And there was a lot of um, trial and error and it was it was very much yeah learning learning as we went. And we also learned a lot about uh, the soil mixture. Not saying that we we would be able. You will see the difference uh, in the later image from Argo. You will be able to see the immediate difference uh, of the color of the soil and the ram earth elements. You will you will see a difference in the refinement of of uh, kind of the surface of the soil. So there were so many valuable. Uh, lessons learned here and um, mm -hmm. I mean as Eileen says that the time it took for us uh, to to build this uh, to ram this one piece I believe we were able to ram two two and a half full pieces and we were four people uh, and it still had like uh, roughness to it and it still had uh, some thoughts that we we wish that we would kind of understand and do better uh, in our next uh, our next approach and i think i think it's safe to say that when we arrived in chicago you know the whole soil um research that we did it was almost like beginning again i mean we had this wonderful uh, sandy yellow soil in Copenhagen that you see here um, that had very different uh, clay content to what we would be working with in Chicago. So it was very much research depending on place and where you were and similarly timber dimensions, everything was adjusted to the new context. And I think we enjoyed that, that dialogue of understanding craft, like an old, this, this technique is yeah, from from Roman times, this ra ra the construction of rammed earth, and maybe it's nice to say, Maria, that the um, Francois Contro, um, there was an architect in the 18th century in France that revived um, rammed earth at the time and he had this DIY manual and that was really the beginning of our study for the rounder. So we based our formwork of the construction from Francois's um, DIY manual and then we began adjusting it from there. And when we moved to DIY manual, um, there was another layer of translation and adjusting it to um, the, the timber sizes, the brick sizes, and again, the, the, the weight of the clay that we'd be using. Exactly. And what we discovered is that uh, different uh, people have different uh, uh, numbers or different percentages of the uh, and So it was very difficult to find a level that was exactly right. <laughs> um, but moving into kind of uh, what it's all about, because um, in the beginning of August, correct? No, in the beginning of July, correct, Eileen? Uh, half of our to team Mexico arrived. halfway through yeah. July. Yeah, yeah. So yes. by the first of August, we were on on the ground. Yeah, and um, and I think we we had be we had become very aware that that um, that we had to step into the local community with the. Uh, with the knowledge that we had collected from back home that we were we were to step like um in a in a positive and in a very kind of uh, natural way into the local community in order to make them excited about the project and uh, make them want to engage alongside with us um so mm -hmm. eileen and james uh, arrived in in chicago in the beginning of august after a few weeks in Mexico um, and started off with uh, a program of uh, four uh, workshops. 
Yeah, and I think I think the arts festival that you see the first po poster here, each of these workshops were uh, extremely important in in laying the foundation within the community, sort of establishing um, a place that an open place that we would welcome people in and that we would spread the word, the story and, and the message of what it was we were about and we were trying to do. And I think we were always extremely aware that, you know, we relied on the community that this, this project, it, it wasn't about um, just us building the space. It wouldn't have been possible on our own. So there were so many people that needed to be part of this story. So the Arts and Crafts Festival that happened in, in Douglas Park, uh, where there were lots of different communities that had their stands. And, and James and I were there with Maxwell, who joined the team um, from um, Cornell University and Amara from Puerto Rico, a ceramicist. And the four of us were, were there with our rammed earth um, boxes and we were giving demonstrations and explaining different types of soil with hammers and I think that was the the very beginning of just reaching out to the community it, it was very hard before we arrived to yeah to meet the right people um, that we wanted to be interested in the project so the, the first uh, event let's say the first weekend we arrived was the arts festival and we've sort of touched on the the soil issues before in in the presentation but what what really happened was that when we began the the project after we had won the competition um the city informed us that the the soil was contaminated on the site and it would be impossible to to penetrate the ground uh so that that was the first challenge in in understanding um what what did that mean you know how was it contaminated why it wasn't contaminated and i think we felt a responsibility um to to explore that further so we collaborated with nancy clem a local ecologist um and she became instrumental in the very beginning of the project that we would yeah start with understanding the material that we were working with and understanding how you know what was soil health and how soil becomes contaminated soil health isn't an issue just for north lawndale but it's a global issue that we, we all uh, need to grapple with so in a way the the issue of soil health and the understanding you know that the soil on the site was contaminated um added a, a real seriousness and a richness i think in in the research that we were doing in parallel to the build-up and designing bricks and also thinking about round earth construction so um so nancy clem came on board and gave a um a workshop one of the weekends and then we also had amara um where we begin to explore the tactility um of clay and yeah really just the components of of clay itself as a component of soil and then obviously the round earth workshops that we advertised but in fact uh, we ran over to four weeks so these were the the four initial kickstarter um workshops that that were held um in north, north londell um with the soil lab team and when i mean when uh James and Aline and, and the extended team kind of moved in on site. Um, it's as we have underlined so many times uh, already is that this local community we were we were absolutely uh, surprised and amazed by the commitment that these people were willing to give us uh, to find interest in a project coming so far away from their everyday life and moving into a vacant lot in their uh, in their uh, neighborhood uh, and that these people were actually willing to step in and spend their time and their days and uh, contribute to the project so these are some of the uh, participants and you can you can really begin to see um yeah the cross the broad spectrum of um people that we had and i mean it was i think the, the richness in the, in this project when i reflect on it after leaving chicago was very much the collaboration with with all of these contributors you know we we had 
I see HC down there in the bottom left, who was who was a retired construction worker, um, age 72. He was the oldest member of the team and he would arrive every morning uh, in a fresh shirt with his packed lunch, um, enthusiastic to to learn a new technique and to to just enjoy being around people um, both from the community and abroad. And there was a real sense of um, of ownership. I think when I when I see um, uh, Antoine in the center there, so we, we met certain people at the arts festival, but then once we began on site, there was there was people from the alley behind the site that were curious that would come out. And I think, um, yeah, it, it, it made a huge difference to us having people directly locally to the site this was their back garden um show interest and show curiosity and to really yeah get on board with this project that that they were making um and i think uh, uh, leaving the project um last week or however long ago two weeks um i think the 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 fact that the community were involved in the construction um ensured that there was an ownership during the project it wasn't like you know these architects designed a space and then gifted it to the community that it was their space they they built it and and each of these spaces i think this is only half of the the people who um contributed um yeah we, we couldn't have done it without them oh, thanks maria and you can see the 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 masons and the uh, carpenters um at the bottom so it was very much uh team collaboration and and each week brought with it new characters and new individuals and new conversations it's quite an, an intimate space to be in a formwork um ramming with somebody so we, we had yeah wonderful uh conversations and i think the crossover of having as i mentioned earlier the skilled craftspeople and the the, the beginners like ourselves on site um eating lunch together um made this yeah the, the whole the whole project and collaboration um, in constructing and sharing the craft really, really rich. And I think it's also kind of going back to what we learned in Copenhagen. And, and I mean, maybe you can agree to this, Eileen, that there, there are simply different processes naturally that take place when you invite people in like this, because different conversations need to happen and kind of everyday life also needs to happen. And, and we all need to understand in, in our own time and on the same time. So it's also about maybe not being as efficient as a, as a kind of driving the project forward because it is a matter of people gaining ownership uh, in the process. No, you're right. And I think that was one of the biggest challenges, like understanding um, your expectations and expectations for others um, in terms of collaborating together. Um, that that sometimes it yeah people didn't have as much energy or, or weren't as strong and those days or those stories are visible in in the soil so you can see when people were tired or you can see when people's skill was improving um, and I think that's very much part of the story that we were all learning together and and each of us yeah brought something different each day. So here we see the, the first 20 tonne of, of soil arriving. Um, we, we located the soil 30 um, miles um, northwest of North Lawndale, uh, where we located uh, soil that was clean um, as opposed to contaminated. And in, in total, we, we used 40 tonne of soil, if you'd imagine, um, on, the, on the project. But that was, that was a, yeah, an exciting day when the permits have been approved from the city. The, the bricks had, had arrived, the brick masons were on site, and then the soil, um, the soil was delivered. But you can see like the wonderful richness. And Maria was mentioning the sandy soil in Copenhagen and showing the, the blonde bricks. And you see here the, the rich, deep, dark chocolate soil with similarly uh, rich um, tiles. And I think there's a lovely contrast in in culture uh, and in, in, in appearance that we were yeah, getting to experiment with, with new materials when we arrived in Chicago. So that's James uh, in, in, in the 
in the formwork there. So I'm conscious of time that we probably need to go a little bit um, uh, faster. But this this drawing is really telling in that um, the formwork, what, what was possible. So we, we originally had an intention that we had three groups and each group had four people in it. And our ambition was that each group would finish one formwork um, every day. But on day one, um, we only had one formwork finished and on day two I think we managed two so we slowly needed to to calibrate as we were mentioning our expectations but this drawing um, of the elevation of the round earth walls hung on the kitchen and when we come home in the evening we would with watercolors um, paint in our, our progress and some some days it felt like we were going backwards um, but we, we we got there in the end um, but you can see how how we calibrated the days and and the time, and the the energy involved in in this whole project, um, with an overview of what that meant for each group of four, um, for for the for those four weeks. And this so, image in the circle, yeah, go ahead, Maria. Sorry, this just delay. I don't know I just uh, wanted to kind of say that this could be a way of starting off the day, right, Eileen, to sit people down and kind of have a conversation of what is going to happen today. Uh, coming in for the first time, some had uh, been there the week before and were able to share their experiences and share their knowledge uh, that they gained already in the prior week to the new group. Um, so this was kind of a, a good way of, of uh, starting out the day. And, and this ring uh, <laughs> that people are sitting in was part of our original idea. You might remember the, the half circle the that we ring. had uh, created in Brick. Yeah, the council mm -hmm. ring, uh, which was one of our initial ideas that came from uh, our inspiration uh, architect Jens Jensen, who had built in a lot of parts of Chicago, uh, where his um, work is actually still present. Um, and this idea uh, was very much visualized uh, through this image where our workshop participants uh, could uh, share their knowledge and, and kind of uh, gain uh, gain new knowledge for the next uh, task ahead. Learn from each other. You're right, Maria. And it was the, the school of soil that, that Jensen um, spoke about and, yeah, and created really, that that was a, a, a crucial part in this idea of an outdoor classroom. And you can see here that that's, that's really what happened. Like, um, uh, Susanna in the, in the pink t-shirt on the left was an Argentinian woman who lived two, two blocks away. And what we didn't realize was the first day Susanna joined the project, she thought we were actually making planters, that that's what all the earth was for and we were going to plant in these boxes. So Susanna came back the next day after doing amount of research last night and came and actually gave a lecture um, to the group the next morning on round earth and its history. So there was these moments of, of sharing knowledge, like Maria says, in the morning where people would be enthused to share what they had either learned the week before or the night before. Um, and it was these kind of um, conversations that, yeah, that, I, that we take away with us that, that, yeah, there was a momentum in the learning that we could stand back from that people were excited to share um, with, with the group as new people joined. A morning stretch could also be a type of circle because uh, uh, what this was, work this was uh, uh this is a very um physical job uh, because it's Seriously. a lot of shoveling a lot of mixture a lot of wheelbarrows and lifting of soil ramming lifting equipment so it's these images are kind of to visualize you that it is a very physical job that this group has been helping us with yeah, and I think maybe it's it's probably good to mention now that you know when we're thinking about available resources, the available city, and the the thinking at the time of of the sustainability of of where your money in a project goes, um, it was very important that 
you know, soil is a is a cheap material, sometimes free material if it's in your back garden and clean. Um, but there's also this idea that uh, we were really aware that asking people to do this very physical work for four hours a day, we'd start at, at eight o'clock in the morning and we'd end with lunch, that um, we had stipends to to pay the um, collaborators. So that for each each day that people were helping us work, that there was a, a small stipend of $15 an hour for their contribution. And that, that was something that was very important to us, um, that you, know, you could put the funds back into the community and also the skill back into the community um, as part of the project. I'm just reminded of it here when I'm seeing people stretching. I mean, it was tough. It was really <laughs> tough. And Chicago, Chicago in August, you're talking like 33, 34 degrees sometimes with very intense heat. Um, you're lucky in this photograph to see uh, a big cloud, which meant um, shade. But I think that the physicality that Maria um, talks about, I'm sure it brought us closer together, but it was um, it was tough. It was really tough. And the stretching was a necessary part um, of every day. But it's encouraging to see the, the blank site that we, we came so far, looking back on um, the, the first week of, of Round Earth. I think that was the very first, uh, the very first day. And I think what was also important while the, the ramming was, was going on was that we were we were kind of focused on zooming in and out of the work, saying that there was a site to be built. There was, um, there was, uh, we had to execute uh, the build up of the site during the month of August. But, but we also felt a, we also felt a strong responsibility to uh, the community. Uh, across age groups and across uh, knowledge to be able to open up the idea of Soil Lab. So this whole um, story and narrative about the soil health that uh, suddenly occurred to us when we weren't able to dig in the soil and, and was made aware by Nancy Kelm of the layers of the soil um, that really uh, resembled the history of the area, uh, moving from prairie land to industrialization to the riots and the big fire. And, and I mean, all these layers became an a very clear image of the history of North Lawndale. So mm -hmm. inviting uh, generations into our site and investigating soil, touching soil um, and uh, kind of feeling it on the skin and getting the knowledge from Nancy Kelm was, uh, became uh, an extra layer added on to the project. So we kind of zoomed out to be able to share these stories with the locals as well. Yeah, you're right, Maria. So there, there was like a an, all of, an unfolding of the, the history within the soil and the different strata and the, in the layers that told the, the story of the community, which was, yeah, a really, a strong understanding that you know of place when you think of the the, the section of the ground um, that that the soil can tell that story. Moving into the next phase after <laughs> after or. While we were finishing off the the elements, we were adding our structure of Dean uh, which is a which is a, a that we we one of our partners from the Danish side has uh, contributed to the project. So as Eileen mentioned, we here have a. Uh, a local partnership with the Revolution Workshop, who is a skilled uh, craft, skilled craftsman, but also teach apprentices. Um, and we we've started to build up the structure on. Um, moving on, where everything kind of. We succeeded in, in raising the round earth element of the brick plant and also, also the wooden structure. So at the on uh, September 17th, 18th, 19th, 
team is able to uh, invite the community back along with their families and of course also all the, the camp representative and the international visitors we have to invite them into Lab. And then we had, uh, yeah, Sheila, a member of the community who spoke on behalf of the community at the opening. And I think, um, yeah, it was really, it was really great to, to I think, you know, reflecting on it now, it seems almost um, extraordinary in a way that that we managed to, to make this space um, sort of emerging from a pandemic against all the odds, with all the challenges that, um, the, yeah, the project, yeah, was a success. And during the opening, we were able to pull in and, and not only the materials and different things that had used, but we were able to kind of give them a feel uh, of working in a clay workshop and kind of give them an idea of the ambition that we had. Um, for this project moving into the uh, into the biannual and into the next few months so everyone was invited to kind of play with the material and create their own version of a brick yeah and it was it was great to see the space activated as soon as the um as the opening happened um i mean seeing the workshop table which is huge when it's empty um, just the scale felt right, seeing all the uh, public come and join that day with curiosity and, and, and play and experiment. It's sort of seeing the envis envisaged idea um, realised. For the opening, we had like uh, also uh, a lot of locals contributing, and uh, this also gave us a sense that we had actually resonated and made really good friends uh, with with the local community group. This is uh, on your left hand side, the Book of Tim Timothy, uh, a local band that were willing to. For two days at the Soil Lab site where they pr played uh, fantastic music uh, to give the ambience to our opening guests. They're yeah, really good jazz musicians that we actually heard at the Arts Festival the first weekend, the kickoff weekend. And you also see the, the Douglas Park uh, dance students here, Sheila, who was the um, lady in the, in the green t-shirt who was speaking on behalf of the community. Her daughters were in the local dance school and she suggested that they could perform at the opening. So it was a real celebration, um, not so much just about the construction, but more celebrating the community. Um, and I think that was really felt um, the, the opening weekend. This is uh, kind of going through uh, the images uh, that that we we leave uh, or the site that we we've left left behind at this point that is ready to invite the local community in and and uh, participate in workshops both online and on site um, and yeah you can you can see the variations in the in the different materials and, and maybe even recognize from the early drawings and, and the early visualizations that, that, that come into life in these images um, where the site really becomes uh, physical and full of material. And I think it's it's probably nice to say that the, the project was envisaged as a construction site, that it would always feel like a work in progress. And I think we, we achieved that from the very beginning, that there was always something new happening. And even now um, that the canopies are up and there's different workshops happening when you're when you're driving by or walking by, there's an openness. It, it feels more like a landscape project than than a, a building. And I think that that was the intention, that there's an open curiosity. Some of the tiles are glazed, others are unglazed. So there's a questioning and an open-ended, yeah, curiosity to, to the way we have um, left the space now. And 
to quickly end up on what is going to be happening at at the site in the ceramic workshop we will be working uh, hopefully within in the next few weeks with extrusion of bricks and this is uh, just a few images to kind of round off this conversation about we want to give the local community an insight as to what is a single brick in comparison to what are you able to build with a brick. And I think the meaning and the symbolism of that brick is, is very much the story of Soil Lab. It's about creating your own unique brick in a way and kind of uh, creating something new from that and a new future in a way. Maybe just as a closing, um, the opening image we had of the uh, the satellite view of the North Lawndale site looking back to Chicago and you could see various vacant lots. The intention that we leave the project and we leave the community now that we've stepped back, that they, they have this knowledge and they have this skill and they have this kiln to, to make these bricks. And the intention was to, to hopefully make structures and to, to populate other vacant lots um, around the city, um, regardless of how long the, the workshop space uh, remains, that it's more this embodied knowledge um, within the community um, that will live on when, when we leave. Thank you so much for, for that really in-depth presentation and I can't imagine a better primer for everybody um, that's viewing and tuning in from home here to actually go out in Chicago and experience this amazing site that has really been transformed by this project. Um, I have so many recollections from the talk that I want to be able to get to and we, we have just you know, a very short amount of time now but sorry we was, took so was, long no it was time very well spent mm -hmm. i mean it's it reminds me of a few of the talks that we've had uh throughout the length of this symposium with artists that were involved in the sustain sustainable societies for the future project um particularly um yesterday we had a conversation with uh detroit-based architect imani day um who was really speaking about the effect of environmental racism within the built environment and um, you know soil health is so much a part of that as well as water health and how we build the environments around us um, and how the communities that are the most divested within particularly American city populations um, sort of bear the brunt of the environmental fallout of, um, of production. Um, and, you know, one of the things that she was speaking about was um, the importance of the founding of the ADA um, as being, you know, an overarching thing that we all, you know, when buildings are built now, they have to adhere to uh, certain standards to allow accessibility, um, even though it's not perfect still, um, there is that, that um, attitude towards this building cannot be built if it does not align with these standards. Um, and I wonder also if, if there is a possibility for this Soil Lab project to contribute to those questions about environmental safety um, in communities and in public space. And, um, you know, if there is an interest from you all to, to work on essentially a list of, of things that would be essential to have um, as environmental health for public space. Did you get the sense of that throughout this project? Yeah, I think one of the, just on that sort of an anecdote, you can buy vacant lots if you're, if you're a neighbor um, for very cheap, sometimes like $1. And I think opening up the, the conversation of soil health with the community meant that there were, there were neighbors that, that had bought land um, one one in particular that I remember, and she had an idea to build an orchard or to to grow an orchard on the um, for apple trees on the site. And when she began to dig down, 
um, there were over six feet of rubble um, that she had no idea existed. So obviously, you know, you couldn't grow uh, an apple tree uh, in in this context. But I think, sorry, I'm getting convoluted, but the, the idea of soil, soil health and um, demolition and regulation um, that doesn't exist uh, in many parts of the world. You mentioned um, an architecture pra practice in Detroit. And I think having those conversations with the community and, and for that to become a discussion that you, you begin to, you know, uncover what is below the section of the ground and for them to be part of the understanding and also just you know what do you do what, you know how has this happened that there are fires and buildings mm -hmm. fold into the ground and then okay this is this is the condition that that we have and what do we do from here and i really think it's i mean cab have done a wonderful job in in highlighting a lot of issues across the city but in a way it's it's the city it's the the bigger structure you know far bigger than cab that that has to make the change to begin with when it comes to um yeah even just like having water access on site um you know it, the city is available but it, but it's not really available when you think of um what needs to happen before before the community use these spaces or if you buy a vacant lot in in its condition with contaminated soil um, I think there's a responsibility that has to come higher up than than us as a contributor within CAB. I don't know if I'm if I'm being coherent yeah. enough here, but I think no, it, it has done. Yeah, by highlighting it, it, it's it's almost you know as much as we can do. But it takes some somebody bigger like the city with with that power to change from the top down um, to 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 yeah to make the sites available and to do what they need to do to. Yeah, let the community use them. Yeah, and returning to Ellen's mm -hmm. opening remarks too, I think what is particularly interesting in the context of this project is that there is, while there needs to be certain top-down change, there is also um, support for bottom-up thinking um, and these really grassroots projects, which I think um, you know, traditional model, as, as you both were speaking about earlier, instead of presenting a nationalist platform, it really is providing a space for this collaboration and exchange. Um, and Ellen, I'm wondering, you know, in all your years at the Danish Arts Foundation and chairing the Architecture Committee, um, if you could just speak a bit about how things have changed in terms of of thinking, um, you know, going from a nationalist perspective, which was very much the norm, into the funding these more um, grassroots projects that seek to highlight um, certain issues instead of necessarily solve them. Um, first of all, um, having an, an international uh, out view is part of the foundation's uh, sort of basic and legal framework that we have to support architecture in Denmark, but also Danish architecture abroad. So it, it sounds a bit like sort of a, a promoting uh, perspective yet, but we, what really has changed is sort of the understanding of trying to link uh, on a vertical axis, right, rather than sort of flying over and landing objects and sort of that kind of show off that basically sort of harshes back to the, the world fairs somehow where mm -hmm. commodities are exchanged and art goes into that perspective. I think what the Soil Lab has, has demonstrated so beautifully here is um, what art, art and architect and design and craft can do in terms of um, um, demonstrating the, the gaps, <laughs> but also using art as an institution to sort of highlight some dilemmas and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and something that needs attention. And, and what I yeah. really think that this project has brought in is um, notions of connectedness, notions of care, trying to relink people, material, 
and economy, uh, the way that you have sort of make all that work around, creating an awareness of the resources we have right below our feet, both in a positive and negative way, because you thought the resource was actually there, but it was <laughs> sort of uh, affected heavily by sort of capital extraction for years. I mean, sort of bringing all these uh, inconvenient um, um, premises to the to the front and to our uh, consciousness, linking uh, via that sort of interaction, our our mind and our senses and our emotions. And I think you did that really beautifully via some a work that looks somehow extremely low key and pragmatic, but all these things happen. And then you can use the cap as sort of a loudspeaker somehow to to uh, to communicate um, these asymmetries and uh, paradoxes and gaps, and but also the hope and promises that are embedded in the project to a much larger audience. Yeah, I mean, how how perfectly put. And you know, there's so many connections that we can continue to make between this and the artist projects that were in the Sustainable Societies for the Future exhibition. But um, you know, at this stage, I just think it's we're only at the beginning of a conversation, um, which is mm -hmm. perhaps most the the most exciting place to leave this off. And so, I wanted to thank you all so much um, for your contribution, not only in Chicago, but um, for joining today. Thank you for, thank having, you for us. having us. Thank you for having us. And yes. so, thank you. And our last, our last program um, as we're leaving the symposium today is a screening um, by a Chicago-based artist who I had the privilege of also working on this exhibition in Chicago um, with a co-curator named Ellen Hartwell Alderman. And that is with Brendan Fernandez. And the piece is called 72 Seasons. Um, two of the three performances have taken place in Chicago in Millennium Park within the Lurie Garden. And the project was supported by the Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events as well as the Harris Theater and the BWP Foundation. And so what we're going to be uh, viewing on a long loop uh, during our last hour um, as part of the symposium is the sneak peek of a full length film that will launch um, following the last performance on October 23rd, 2021. And until now, we have documentation of the two first performances that took place on August 21st, as well as September 25th. Um, the title of the work, 72 Seasons, refers to the Japanese calendar of seasons that are divided into just five day segments. And so the two that we'll be seeing today are uh, dancers and a history of ballet response to the Four Seasons Ballet, but through the Japanese calendar. Um, and those two performances are Thick Fog Blankets the Sky and Thunder Lowers Its Voice. Um, the final performance entitled First Frost Falls is taking place on October 23rd. Um, and so with that, thank you everybody so much for joining and uh, we will turn over to the screening and um, See you hopefully at the next symposium. Thank you.